live. This is the main field chasing down our four breakaway rides. The gap then coming down all the time. It's around about 30 seconds now. They're inside the final 32 kilometers to go of this the flesh alone. Started in Spa this morning and we're heading towards three where the riders will finish the third time up that climb where the question is, can that little breakaway group, which formed uh, not long after we went across the second climb of Hui, can it stay out there against the pressure which is coming on from a large field of riders still in contention? And Lamprey sending up Gonchenkov to drive this one along. And just behind there for uh, the Gavis team, and uh, that's Kengi Alta. See the Gavis begin to pull through at the moment. And this inter and now Borman's coming up to the front. Well, 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 nice to see Chris at the front. He's been hovering around the back so far. I think he's recognizing now with something like about, uh, what, 32 kilometers yet to go. Uh, that's um, well, 20 miles of racing left in front of us that perhaps he could be in with a shout. We'll see how he goes on that final climb because that really is uh, uh, one that splits the field. He always did last year. And that was the time last year, though, when we saw the dominance of the Gavis team, when they finished in first, second, and third place. Argentin ran out the victor. Berlan was second, and Berzin was in third spot, and Bunyo back in fourth. No wonder they're putting the pressure on here. The gap is down to 12 seconds, with that group up there in front, now recognising that their time is up. Uh, if you just join us on Eurosport, and this is the flesh below, and the fellow just tailing off towards the back there, Axel Merckx, the... Famous son now, he's getting famous anyway, the way he's riding, a very, very famous father, uh, is uh, sitting up a little bit, I think he's recognised, there's no sense going on, and Sorensen there, together with Denbaka and uh, Piccoli, their moment of glory, looks like it's over, as this bunch is really eating up the gap between them. The whole thing about cycle racing is, if you're lying, what about to fifth, six back in the front, you see him just to, still pedalling, but it's almost like freewheeling. It, all the work's being done at the front end. If you've got a field this big, it really can hound down a breakaway group of four if they really put their mind to, because uh, everybody can do a little, little bit of turn on the front, then swing back, whereas the four men up there who've been away a long time now don't have that sort of uh, shelter from the wind because uh, they just can't with only four men uh, persist at the rate at which the chase is coming. But it needs a concerted effort from a team. We've seen Gavis move through now for a long time when the gap was around about one minute. There was no major team having to go on the front. Gavis then looking for a victory today. Uh, have now started a roll this one. And Gonchenkov uh, really has been sent out the Ukrainian as the uh, uh, as the driving force for this one. He's been on the front all the time. The rest behind us has been peeling off to allow him to uh, uh, have some support from behind. But Gonchenkov. If Pondrius gets this one, he better give him a pat on the back when he's finished because he's been the, the man that's done most of the work. There Gonchenkov for Lamprey, ease himself back now. I think, is he going into a gap? <laughs> he gets a little push on the bum and puts him in again. Poor chap, he's actually riding himself into oblivion here and he's been pushed back in. There you see at the finish, a three, the big um, uh, television camera, uh, which is showing up on a screen here for the crowd to watch the action. We had the same thing uh, at the, uh, the Paris-Roubaix because the Society de Tour de France, who organised the Paris-Roubaix, organised the Feche Cologne and the Liège Baston Liège, uh, have bring along that great big uh, screen so people can see what you're seeing out on the uh, on the road. And television does bring you bike racing at its best. It's not that bad. It's standing on the side of the road. My friend J.P. Nicholson said many years ago, it's like watching a football match through a knot hole in a fence. You don't see much, do you? Well, here television brings you it, and you can really get into the sport and fascinate the number of people who are not cyclists who now can, can understand that these chaps are travelling at uh, speeds between 30 and 40 miles an hour, and they're riding anywhere between 120 and 160 miles a day, and they're riding day in, day out, what superb athletes they are. And of course, when they go crashing down too, we often see, imagine the centre of this field now, just a touch uh, of a wheel against somebody alongside, and down you go. Uh, then you really get knocked out. And other sports, of course, a bit of a batching on the old knee, and you're off for six weeks and complaining about it all, but not cyclists, the way which Ballerini hit the deck in the Gent Velodrome and got back on his uh, bike, started training again for the Paris Bay. And his team manager said, well, we're going to let him ride because I'd rather have half a ballerini in the Paris Bay than no ballerini at all. And what's he do? A man who was lying there inert on the ground in the Gent Velodrome on the Wednesday there on Sunday, he wins one of the hardest bike races in the world. These are tough men. Sorensen in the back, then back in front. Second for the front, Mex, and Piccoli leading it round. 
just hoping now that out of sight, out of mind, and these twists and turns in the town that the bunch behind them might ease back a bit. The chase can't be so coordinated when the road twists and turns like this. See how they clip the curb, whizzing round. And again. See the anxious looks over the shoulders, they see the motorcycles coming through, and here comes the cavalry, charging along with Gonchenko on the front still. The Ukrainian, well, if Fondres wins, it's going to be a large Pere water for him tonight, I thought. He's really worked himself into the ground. This man has not let up at all. He's drifted back maybe fourth from the front, and he's driving on and driving on. He's riding for one man in there. Maurizio Fondres is a man who won this race in uh, 1993, and his teammate has just now ridden himself into the ground to pull that brake back. That's it. It's all over. Volpi goes through for Gillis. Now, what's the next tactic coming up here? We have to look further back down the field here. See one or two riders begin to move through to see if they can launch himself off on this climb then of the Bohiso. This 325 metres above sea level at the top. A short, sharp climb again. They drop down the other side to Ben Hachin and then the Cote Dachin after that one, then the Hui. So in short, sharp order, we've got um, three climbs now. And C102 ride begin to trickle up to the front. The domestics, they call them, have done their work. They pull this thing back together again. Now the big men will start to go and the hopefuls will start to fire off. Gastrama trying that and as they start up there, Francois Simon, just a quick look at his chain wheel set he went past. He's not riding the uh, unusual chain wheel set which uh, the Casaramas have been riding. I had a good look at it uh, last week, didn't have a chance to see it today, but the Casaramas have got an unusual chain wheel set. It's, uh, We've seen oval chain wheel sets before, we've uh, seen the sort of semi-square ones that Shimano turned out, and now there's a, there's a new version called the Harmonic, uh, which, they're, which they're trying, which is the combination between a square and over and around chain ring. It looked most unusual to me. I'm surprised. They say it actually feels 10% faster. Well, this young lad isn't on one. Here we go. This is where it explodes. Eyes down, looking. This is Stuart O'Grady, he's been riding very well since he had the problems with his knee because certainly Gannett throwing everything into this one. They moved Chris Borman up into the top 20 or so on the climb. Is Gavis that rider just going to sit on it? I think he is. Yeah, not prepared to press on with this one because there's some team tactics going here as uh, Fratini, now there's another young up-and-coming rider, is uh, beginning to show at the front, but I think they're still waiting a bit more, playing tactical moves for their, their teammates. So one's hope of glory from oneself disappears when you've got to just ride on for somebody else. Uh, Cedric Vassour it is for Gann, but uh, Jalabert has launched an attack and also across there he's been quickly marked. Look at Jalabert on the front now. He made it look so easy, didn't he? The way he took off on the Poggio in the Milan San Remo, he did the same thing. He went up to uh, Fondres. That's Fondres on the right hand side of the screen. Burton here, number two on the left here. 
So we've now got three of the star men that have been waiting and uh, letting their domestics do all the work and suddenly they start to go. Jalabi on the front in the yellow, then the pale blue of uh, Berzin and the pink and blue of Fondres. The big men have now come to the front. His face. And Fondres. They know, these three know each other. They know what damage they're doing further back down the field. Are they going to ride together or are they going to wait? Smooth roads helping Pondres here, that back of his not being buffeted by the cobbles and like that uh, cartoon I saw it in one of the uh, sports magazine, little devils punching tires and uh, hurting people in the parallel way. Not happening now, it's nice and smooth, but the race is still half at 205 kilometres. The threesome at the front, uh, Jalabert, Berzin and Fondrest on this, the Flesh Fallone, starting spa this morning, working its way around to Hui. Just tell us Cravers joining up with them. Well, here's another man who's been looking for the form this year. Very good time trialist, and uh, let's see if he can add some firepower to this one now. The crowd at the finish, watching and waiting. Although it's in Belgium, a lot of the French people will be looking for the French-speaking part of Belgium for success from Jalabert, who's leading on the front at the moment. Jalabert, he's riding up this one as if it's uh, just not hurting him at all. And look at the gap they've got up now. They really have opened this one up. Jalabert looking so comfortable. Something like nine victories he's had so far this season. Dallas Cuevas has been dropped off the back. I said he's just searching for the form. It hasn't quite come his way so far. And so we've got Jalabert, Berzen and Fondrich in that order. This really is now showdown of the top men and Jalabert is doing all the driving he's not even sat up and, and let the other two come through this is showing enormous confidence for a man who in the Tour de France de Montier was buried in the tarmac and lost uh, four teeth they had to feed him through a tube uh, he went down on the rest day to see his teammates and he could hardly talk to them he was in such a state that was in july last year and uh, to large extent, having, having lost a little bit of weight from that crash it certainly helped him because he, he was best looked as a sprinter roman and taking the green points jersey in the tour de france but now he's become much more an all-rounder winner of the opening World Cup race of the year, uh, the Milan San Rain, when he screwed Pondres, who's now just ahead of him. And Dillas Craver still groveling at the back and hoping that once over the top, I know so many riders will recognize the feeling. You just can't force it up the climb, and you just think, well, I get over the top of this one, I'll put the big gear and I'll go. I'll go for them and I'll get back on again. And you just have to stay there. You have to hope. You have to just get over the top and stay within a, a sight of that little group in front. And then you get to them, you can breathe, you can get some, uh, some rest. But on your own, you've got no chance against three men are going out. You've just, just got to get over the top, keep the gap comfortable and close it. Delas Cravers is grinning his teeth now. These three men are going away. Jalabert on the front, first and second, then Fondret in third spot. Just at the top now. La the mail order company that very much sponsored Paris Bay, helping with a special prize in the Flesh Balloon for the King of the Mountains. They had also a special prize for the uh, uh, couple sessions of the Pave. As Sorensen starts to drive this one forward and catches De Las Cuevas. In the Paris session of the uh, Paris Bay, the prize went to, to Franco Ballerini. With 30 points, the German rider Dietz got 26 points, and the Italian Van der Arden was equal 22 with the Frenchman Jean Claude Colotti. And they uh, split 104,000 uh, French francs between them, uh, Ballerini collecting 30,000 francs for his troubles. That's about just under 4,000 quid this Ballerini got for leading on the 
on the Pave section on Sunday, apart from his overall prize for being victor in that race. Ladrup then also being involved in this, the Flesh Malone, three men away. Yellow is uh, Ballerini, sorry, yellow is Yalaba, blue is Burton, and the pinky colour, Fondrest. There's ten riders chasing them down, and here they are, that's your second group on your screen now. Let's see who's the real firepower in that one. Fratini, well, he won't chase because he's a Gavist rider, but he's had a very good start to the season so far. But Fratini has the ability to win this race as well. Faulty rider driving through. And these are our three leaders. Well, as far as uh, Fondres is concerned, Victor, in 1993, if he can get this one, that's going to be showing the Italian domination in the Flesh for Loam because Argentine won it in 1990, again in 1991. Furlan took it in 92. Fondres won it in 93. Argentine won it last year in 94. The Italians have won uh, the uh, races over the last five years, and they've got uh, another man in this breakaway group at the moment. The Italians in the flesh for loan, a total of 12 victories. Are they going to get it again this year? Last figure I saw, the Italians had won uh, up to Sunday, so in fact you put one more in there. 62 races have been won by Italians and 61 by other nationalities as at uh, up, to, up to Sunday. And let's see who's going to get this one. That's this year's score. 11 seconds, well, it doesn't seem to be quite enough to me. And I'm sure one or two can jump across, as we're seeing now. First Italian victory in the Flesh Malone came back in uh, 1948 when uh, Camellini won this race. And these are two trying to get across there. Three, it's actually say two, they all come back and he starts to go again. Are they going to persist with this one? Cassi Grandi is quite a useful rider. He's, he's forcing this pace on at the moment, the, the faulty rider. And I just wonder how much power they're in Martin Den Bakker because he's still up there and been in an early group. And now they're coming back at him now as uh, Bunyo, number 11 there, sits in. Now there's a likely character. <laughs> Here we are. This is, this is the Fritz and Mayonnaise, by the way, the speciality of this part of the world. Yes, she had a little right smile with that one. So when I'm out on races, I end up with a cold by the time we finish. Still, Berzin on the front. Then, Pondes going through. Then, Jalabert. The last French victory was back in 1987 when Leclerc won it. The, the French have had just six victories so far, so the whole of France will be holding its breath for the rider in the yellow colours, the Onsi rider. We've not had... Um, a Russian rider win this race, so that could be the first time ever if he stays away with that uh, little group. But uh, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. This looks to me as if we've got uh, a pretty significant chase going on now. And there's some pretty good riders in there too. Rooks in the red, white and blue TDM colours. National champion, extremely good climber. Actually, his great long-term mate, I don't know if you caught up with the fact, but Tegut and Tunisa, uh, they used to call them all the twins, although they look nothing alike. Both, twins, both the Rooks and Tunisa kept riding for the same team. And when they were separated, they didn't seem to ride together so well. They always shared the room together when they were in the same team. Well, uh, Tunisa now, at something like 32 years of age, has had all sorts of uh, breathing problems since the Tour of Mediterranean on this year, and he's had lots of checkups, but. Uh, they, they can't resolve the problem, so uh, Gautier Tunisa, uh, past winner of the uh, King of the Managers in the Tour de France, has decided uh, enough's enough, and he's retired from the scene. What an interesting trio here. Congress, 
Jalabert and Young Bursey. Three really class riders here. But a gap only 12 seconds. They really are, uh, between the three of them, uh, obviously tempting Providence to, to, to stay away like this, but the, uh, the normal tactics of people of this uh, quality is to, uh, is to wait for their teammates to come up with that, that short gap. They're still prepared to, to make the legs hurt behind, and you can see here that the, the concentration uh, that the crowd have got upon the, the fact that that gap is hovering around about, what, 12, 15 seconds or so with these three riders here and coming up to this climb, that will certainly help them. The ninth of the tenth climb today, and this one, as we go over the, uh, the Côte d'Achin, just 317 metres above sea level. Uh, the bottom of the Ben Hagen is uh, 164 metres, so they've got about 150 metres of climb, about 350 feet or so uh, is the climb that they've got to, uh, the actual where they go up. Uh, it's, it's, it's not going to be that bad, but when you're racing for the thick end of 200 uh, uh, kilometres, and you're racing up all the season you've got now, then they can be very testing. And that's a, just a useful little gap they've still got. But on, on a short, sharp climb like this, somebody who's prepared to sprint up the hill might well just be able to close that gap and go across. And let's uh, wait and see what happens. The three leaders, in fact, might, they did, but no, it's be interested to know that, that that group of about 12 men are likely to be absorbed by a bigger bunch behind, which uh, will probably disrupt the chasing action. So that this could, in fact, work in favour of the three riders here. Bondes, past uh, winner of the World Cup. Berzen back here. In third spot, and Jalabé. You can see how it's being split up a little bit now, heading up towards that climb. Group of Bunyo, that's nice to put him in there. As uh, 11 seconds back, and Ellie at 21 seconds back. It's 38 round for himself, isn't it, when you look at this little lot, because uh, I think somehow Onsay are no longer in contention as regards to blocking any tactics. I think Donchenko, who did all the work for Bondes to leap across and go up there into lead, is probably blown a gasket now, so. Back in that chasing group. When you know, last we saw Sans was also in there. So the MG Techno Gym have still got a couple of riders there, and that could uh, could work in their favour. Jalabert takes him round first. Rosin just behind him, and then Pondrest. looking back over his shoulder. These, these uh, straight stretches certainly are well and truly in sight of the chasing group. Jalabert's last performance in the Flesh Fallone in 1992. He finished in, in 18th spot. Berzin, when he rode last year in this race, when the Gavis team dominated, finished in, in third spot. There's a right good mixture of teams in that one. Burson, of course, by finish he did last year in the third spot, set really the platform for his superb performance at Lays Baston Liège when he won that one with Armstrong second and uh, Furlan, his teammate for Gavis, in, in third spot. And from then on, of course, Burson didn't look back, moving into the Tour of Italy in such fine form and dominating that one. So we've got an interesting little group up in front, those, that three-man breakaway. Yellow jerseys begin to move through, but there's only the odd on seeing there. Most of the other ones are Mercatone Uno jerseys to break, or to do the chasing, not to break the rhythm. Andres pulls out off the front. And has won the World Cup both in 1992 and 91. Andres there. 
winner of the Milan San Remo in 1993. He won the Championship of Zurich that year in 93. That's when it uh, really gave him the points he needed towards winning the World Cup. And that was the year he finished in third spot, Mondrist, in the Leeds Classic. And Shandy finished in, in fourth behind him. When Mike Front is a world champion uh, after Steve Bauer and uh, here we go so down look at the Italian I've just <laughs> stopped in midstream there because look at the number of Italian uh, flags on that it's a chasing group to the Tunisburg and then that two that aren't there now we're going further back down the list because these are the other longer numbers as such and we're getting some more uh, mixture of nations in there but uh, the Italians undoubtedly in that, that second group uh, seem to be virtually about a third of them and I wonder whether they're all going to chase down Fondus or perhaps uh, work the old national tactic to let them uh, have a chance of uh, yet another success for Italy this year. I say when uh, Fondus won the World Championship in that when Bauer and Croquillion crashed, everybody said that uh, it was a bit of a fluke, but he's shown since then consistency in winning so many of the, the major events. Doesn't seem to be able to form, uh, keep his form in a big tour as such. And so maybe we might ever see him winning one of, the, one of the really big tours. But um, undoubtedly, perhaps as he progresses over the year, he might uh, be able to stand the pressure. But this young man here, uh, number two, surprised everybody by his brilliant performance last year to take the, uh, the Tour of Italy. There he goes moving through. Fondo is such an elegant, stylish rider. Any young lad watching this program right now, if you just, just watch, in fact, all these riders, um, Gallivan might be a bit straight arm um, and perhaps not quite as relaxed as the other two. But if you look at Burzin and, uh, and Fondo, you'll see two riders with, with beautiful positions on the bikes. They're so relaxed. They, they really are hammering along here. I feel it's probably. Fondus is one of the most stylish people on the bike. Even when he's going fast, he never seems to sweat or struggle. Or you look at his face, he looks like he's making it uh, so easy. Yeah, on the right-hand side of the screen, they cover 187 kilometres, 17.8 kilometres to go. Coming up then towards some um, uh, 10 miles left in this race. We're translating the kilometres into miles for people back in England and the rest of viewers across Europe who listen to the English version will know exactly what 17 kilometres are. But I try and uh, update that for English viewers because as yet we still haven't gone to kilometres. We've been decimalising everything except our uh, distances and long way we still have miles, says he. Uh -uh. Now then. The hammer's come down, a bit of concerted chasing coming on here. I thought we might see something uh, in the way of that. The MG have just put uh, Nicola Loder on the front, and Bunyo looking back to see where Pat Sorensen has got to. They've got three men here, at least here. There we are. In fact, they've got another one here as Rebellin uh, for MG goes through. They're setting this one up, I think, for uh, Bunyo. The way they're riding now looks to me like they're going to sacrifice themselves. Sorensen tried to get away earlier on, but uh, as Ellie comes through now, there is Bunyo lying third in the string. Now, we know he can climb well, uh, but look who's marking then. Uh, Fratini, number five for the, uh, uh, for the, uh, M uh, for the uh, Gavis team, sat just on the wheel, so the three MGs have got to sit there. <laughs> look, they all know they're on screen now. Oh, yes, it's, here we are. Look, we're on screen. And so, just about some 10 kilometers yet for this race, heading to Hui. It's uh, south... Um, West by the Maastricht. If you come down from Maastricht through the age down to Hui, that's where the finish is at the moment. That big river we've just been looking at with the river Maas, and uh, the town of Hui just on the edge of the Maas. In this, the Ardennes pa uh, part of, uh, of Belgium. Of course, when we have the ladies bass on the edge on Sunday again, the Maas River runs up. Uh, or uh, through Liège. Honestly, well, I'm pretty certain to the Rhine. The Marseille ends up in, in the Rhine, tips out its water out into the North Sea eventually. 
coming up as it does do from uh, Shralwa Namur through Hui up through Liege, Maastricht, the, the Maas heading right up. That's because of Maas Maastricht gets its name from. Uh, and the start of the Maas way down towards the Samba Merze, just uh, southwest of, of Shralwa. No crocodiles in that river. Now then, Jalabert and Berzin and Fondres, you have a problem here because the hammer has gone down in no one's... Look at his face now, the MG Techno Jim driving this one forward, Bunyo into second slot. He won't do much, now watch as he comes through. He'll only probably do half a turn and wait for his next friend to come through because they're setting this one up for, for uh, Bunyo, but still... Elliot is... And they look down this lovely wooded part of the world. And they come out from the mass, head up towards Hui. The final climb, the third time up Hui. They went four times up it last year. They've been so close to being caught, just stranded out those between 10 and 15 seconds separating these riders, mile after mile. MG Techno again, still driving this one forward, but Gavis uh, put a man in there, I think it might be Fratini, he's just moved in to second spot. And the, well, this instruction is coming up, you see. And what's going on at the front? The Gavis team manager telling his riders what to do. So, Emmanuel Bombini for Gavis just had his moment there as Bunyo it is. After his two teammates have really done all they can, they've now peeled off the front and they've dropped the neutral service car in between, so that says to me, in fact, the gap is beginning to grow a little bit. Onsay are not going to chase this one down. Lamper are not going to chase this one down. Givis are not going to chase this one down. As Jean-Mi Leblanc standing up in that uh, red car behind observes the action of these three great star riders. Still, can they be caught on the final run in to finish at Hui? That's the shot you've just seen off a helicopter. Amazing how these uh, helicopter pilots and Cameron can bring you bike racing at its best here on Eurosport. On this, the uh, Flesh Falone starting Spa going to Hui for the third time, beginning to move up toward the finish inside those final. Uh, what, 16 kilometres or so now. That is what's left of the chasing group. You see all the team cars have moved through now. And uh, the gap then, 31 seconds between the Bunyo gap, because Bunyo is the one that's driving the front. There he's out the front of that group. Then he's got one of the riders from Gibis on his wheel. Mercatone Uno beginning to try and move themselves up for Casagrande, number 31. He's the one to watch out for. They look so unconcerned, but still that gap 31 seconds. He's looking more comfortable now. At one time, just 10 seconds separated. Then he went to 15, then 12, then back to 10. So much work having to be done by the... This, oh, Eli, Eli's been dropped, yeah, and uh, he just did a good job here for Bunyo, but the gap has gone to 31 seconds. Bunyo's got to do it all in his own now. He won't want to tow that lot up, though, because he's just dragging other riders up, and yes, it's uh, Fratini, number five, was just behind him there, uh, and he, he won't want to just, just tow up somebody like Fratini. He's got to wait for somebody else to come through, and at the moment, nobody else is showing that they're interested at all in, uh, in going after this group here. Are they going to stick together to the finish? Are we going to find... Uh, them sprinting it out up that uphill finish. Well, certainly Fondres and uh, Jalabert are both quick when it comes what they uh, are going uphill. Part <laughs> of the of the cavalcade up in front. That's rather smart, isn't it? So the the crowd now well aware of the position out there on the race. Oh look, we see our feet on telly.
some consolation for these three riders now. They look back, to they've got the motorcycles behind, they've got the car there with Jean-Marie Blanc. They know now that, in fact, uh, that gap, that 30-second, is probably sufficient for them to, uh, to stay out and keep out of, uh, out of trouble. So who out of this little lot can do something about that? We've seen Bunyo try to do it, he just didn't have enough power to, to fire away. So perhaps they're all now riding for fourth spot. It just isn't there in anybody's legs, enough of the power. That's a Kodahin, less than 10 kilometers to go. The rally we saw in the red, white and green colors, the national champion of uh, Italy by the Brescia, that's uh, Padenzana, but he was sitting at the back. As Berzin looks over his shoulder, and so does uh, Jalabert. Just imagine that. We've got less than 10 kilometers to go. They've got the climb of the Cui yet to come. The gap is still about 30 seconds. Can anybody go across that gap? The riding is so smooth at the front. And Bunyo has been doing all the work. He's just driving on. He looks over his shoulder. Well, with all due respect to the career rider coming through at the moment, he doesn't have the power, say, of something like Claudio Chiapucci, who's gone off uh, down to ride the Tour of Aragon. Uh, Rooks there, uh, in the old days, the red, white, and blue colours, the national champion of uh, Belgium, uh, of Holland, should be able to do something. But the one man who should go through now, Casagrande, number 31, with his Palti rider now, uh, it looks like there may be a chance uh, of... Uh, him having a little go. So uh, Casagrande in the yellow has to start driving this one. We look there at number five, uh, Fratini in the blue colours. He's not going to do anything then because he's a Givis rider. There just doesn't seem to be enough firepower in that chasing group to do anything about it. They've let Bunya do a lot of work to sap his strength when he comes to that climb, but can Casagrande launch an attack and go across the gap? They're keeping the speed nice and, uh, and tidy. Not relenting at all, these three on the front. Thirty-six seconds, so the gap is growing at the moment. Well, the other man then from the MG team, we've seen Bonio try to cross the gap, we've, Ellie's now been blasted out, Rebellion did a lot of work, but Ralph Sorensen was in that uh, leading group at one time, the Danish rider, has he got anything left to try and go across, or did that uh, session out in front slow him down? There's him on the front, then Fondris, then Jalabert. Now these two we're looking at now, finishing the reverse order in the Milan San Remo. This year, so they've got a score to settle, and Berzin will be waiting for those two, I'm sure, to try and settle that score, and any way in which they uh, slip up, he will take advantage of it. They could play into Berzin's hand in the blue jersey there, the enmity, if you can use the word enmity, because I'm, I can't think that Fondris or Jalaba have any personal enmity, they're two nice blokes, but certainly they've got a score to settle here. Berzin coming into this race now with the mileage he put in, the uh, tour of the Pay Basque when he finished in, uh, in fourth spot in his legs. So many of these riders have been riding special tours just to get their themselves in good order for the big battles yet to come. And Berzin, to me, could be the man coming into form to surprise these other two. Jalabert, winner of the Paris earlier this year, started his season last year in tremendous form too, dominating the Tour of Spain, which has now been moved back to the back end of the year. But Jalabert winning something like nine races so far this season. And he certainly showed in the Criterium International when uh, he won the first stage with uh, Berzon in second spot and Bobrick third. Then Jalabert on stage two that day was overall victor. 
And let's look back then. I was saying how much the Italians have dominated since 1990. Claude Croquillon, the last Belgian to win this race in 1989. And Jean-Claude Leclerc in 1987 was the last Frenchman. You saw there the name of Laurent Fignon, uh, co-commentator for the uh, French side of Eurosport, uh, the winner of the year before that. It's rather interesting, I've discovered that Laurent Fignon plays a saxophone. Now, there's a piece of useless information to you, but, uh, but he bought it in 1992 in, in Chicago. And surprised Yanni Bunya, we've just seen on the tour of Mexico, by actually playing Happy Birthday to you. So Mr. Bunya will be aware of Mr. Uh, Fignon's saxophone playing ability. In fact, I think they're trying to form a trio at the moment. Uh, saxophone player Fignon with Jean Louis Leblanc, who also uh, plays the saxophone, and uh, we have uh, uh, Philippe Soudre, who's good on the clarinet all the way around. But uh, certainly, these cyclists or cycling supporters uh, have uh, interesting wind instruments for some reason. Hello, uh, uh, uh. things are beginning to change. And uh, is this a mad action from the front, or we like to see somebody going across? It's Giannetti of Pulsi at the moment. We saw him move up to Casa Grande. Um, the Casagrande couldn't hold his wheel, so he dropped off on his own, but the gap's only like 40-odd seconds. In the Criterium International, which we, we had on television, the way in which uh, uh, Jalabert uh, took that uh, stage up the climb, and there we see quickly, we, we had a quick look at uh, Bernardino, by the way, uh, Jalabert uh, beat uh, Bobrick on the climb, then with Frattini into, into third spot, and in the time trial, although Pascal Lance won that, Berzin was in second spot, but Jalabert finished third. Jalabert being showing very good time trialling performances uh, against uh, Berzin, who is also an extremely quick time trial. There on the left-hand side of the screen is uh, Bernardino, one of the members of this uh, Society of Tour de France, on the organisation side of this race. Also occupy the position of course director, would like to call him that, on, on Sean Kelly's farewell race. He sat in the car all the way through, and the rest of us had to grovel on our bikes. But there we are, version on the front. Still that 40 second gap. Well, you can see on your screen then, that's uh, just four kilometres to go. That's about two and a half miles. I'm trying to see if these rods are going to... In fact, I, I would really think possibly they're going to wait for that final climb up the... Uh, up the wood, up the final uh, way. Now they've been climbing as well too, as we saw on the Criterium International, that, that climb just out from his own hometown when he uh, romped up there, held up Bob Rick, so he, he can go up the hill very well indeed. Pondrist, a useful climber too. And here, one of the journalists asking for some in-depth uh, analysis from Bernard Hino, who won this race in 1979 and again in uh, 1983. So he, he certainly knows, but mind you, those days it used to change all over the place. When Hino won it, it was Esno um, uh, Marcinelli was when was the route of the race that year. And when Hino won again in 1980, that was the first time we used the Hui Hui circuit, and uh, Anderson of Denmark got it in 84, Krakilio in 85, and we went to this Spa Hui circuit since 1986. And I'm not quite sure he's prepared to, to, to go on with this one. So it's, it's a course, in fact, uh, that had so many different... Uh, Direction. It started out in 1936 to Flesh Fallone on Tournai to Liege. It went Mons Liege, Mons Marcinelli, Mons Schwalwa, Mons Liege, and so on. Now it's settled down to Spa since 1986. And who's going to be victor this year? Well, they certainly are firing off the front of this one, but uh, I think perhaps they might have left themselves uh, a little bit too late in their attempts to, to close, on, uh, close down that uh, breakaway group up in front. Those Three very, very strong rides indeed. There's some good quality talent here, but they might still be riding in for fourth place. Uh, number 31, the one I thought might do something about it, uh, uh, Francesco Casagrande, Mercatone Uno. And who's gone down the road? Well, we certainly saw the Pulte man off in opposite. There's Rooks. 
with an unusual humpback style. Ah, he's another new lease of life here as uh, De Las Cuevas, who got dropped on the climb bit further back down there, has suddenly come back from the dead. Every cyclist knows this, by the way. You can go through an awful bad patch and you just hang on for a grim death and stuff plenty of food down inside you and drink as much liquid as you can do and hang on and hope that they, you don't get dropped off the main pack. And then when your strength returns, you can go as well as you did before. So that may be what's happened as far as uh, De Las Cuevas is concerned. And he's now got himself back in the thick of things and hoping to try and pull back that, uh, that little group up in front. There's Fondrest being looked after by his wife Ornella since he had that problem on his back. And now showing no signs of that one, but... Fondrest still smarting from the fact that he got beaten there by Jalabad just behind him. In fact, he has happy memories of the day when uh, he won the, the uh, Milan San Remo in 1993, did Fondrest, because that was the day that he, he bought, his daughter was born as well. But a uh, little disappointment was last year when, when Jalabad popped him at the, uh, put him at the post. Those who know his uh, wife, Parkman Colonel, his uh, little daughter is Maria Vittoria. Persing going through. And that little lad looks very punchy and very sharp indeed. And for a man who was a world amateur pursuit champion and a member of the Russian World Amateur Team time trial team way back in 1990. He knows how to roll pretty quickly. He's what they call the crop of the 1970s as a person. There's a lot of the young riders coming through. Just seem to be around about the 70, 71. They were born and Bersin from Freiburg in Russia. Spent a lot of his professional life in Italy now where he's that's why Stella is living. Winner of three stages in the Giro d'Italia last year when he won it overall. And the British follows the sport, by the way. Remember Burrs in, in the Kellogg's uh, Pro Tour in Swansea. Constitution Hill, which is a... Uh, it's just like a, a wall of pave, as bad as anything you'll see out here in, uh, in, in Belgium. Oh, France, that was the one he romped up there, and uh, at one time he was five minutes clear of the main field, and at that time he was, he was raced in on the road. That's the first time I really noticed him, although, of course, having noted him way back as well, amateur pursuit champion, he, he jumped into being uh, a very good uh, man when it comes to climbing up the little uh, sharp, short, sharp uh, hill. So, a man who started out at uh, 14 years of age in the uh, St. Petersburg trap school, he turned into a jolly good climber, that's him on the front at the moment. So he's bursting going to rock it up this one, he has the power to do it, as Jalabé is on his wheel in the yellow on the right-hand side, and Fondrest. Bursin might uh, want to let these two sort out their differences, they're on the climb up the Hui for the final time, and this is the flesh for loan. Bursin can climb, he took the uh, King of the Mountains in the Kellogg's Pro Tour as well. So he can go up this one. Jalabo has shown that he can climb by that uh, tremendous ride in the Criterium International. We know that uh, Fondres likewise is a good climber, so we've got three extremely good all-rounders. The two at the back are probably slightly better sprinters than Burzin, but all these three can go up, and that's what this road is doing now. I'm sure many are watching this back at home now. A picture favourite. Do you want the Russian Burzin out there to win the race, which he finished in third spot last year before he went on to win the Lady Bastogne Is he going to Fondrest on his way back after injury? Will it go to Jalabert? Winner of something like nine races so far this season. The punchy style, a burden on the front. Fondrest lying second, Jalabert third. They make it look so easy. They'll be racing now for nearly 205 kilometers. And Burzin is trying to get away, but Fondres has marked him. 
and Jalaba looks so calm, so collected, so cool, and Fondis will remember when he went away on the Poggio in the Milan San Remo this year, how easily Jalaba caught him. He'll be concerned that the Jalaba is behind him. Berzin is in the hot seat on the front. He has got to explode and open up a gap here, Berzin, otherwise he's going to tow these two up. And of them all, to me, Jalabert looks the most unconcerned, looks so cool. These three riders who stayed away in these final commit as Fondres accelerates and Berzin's blowing a gasket and so it's Fondres now as Jalabert is winning. Fondres is opening up a gap. Is he going to get his revenge for the Milan San Remo when Fondres was pipped at the post by Jalabert now, who's sitting on his wheel? Fondres is giving it everything he's got. And Fondres is trying so hard, but Jalabert looks calm and cool. He comes up with the inside, and Jalabert couldn't go past as Fondres didn't deliberately block him. But they're rocking all over the place, and Jalabert's making it look so easy. This man is unstoppable this year. The winner of the uh, San Milan San Remo and the Pirates has added what looks like his 10th victory of his career. Winner also of Criterium International. Now the winner of the Flesh Falone, the Frenchman. Jalabert has taken the victory to add to that that has been won by uh, Leclerc in 1987, the last Frenchman to get this victory. The French have had six times victories in the past, and now Jalabert makes it number seven. <laughs> Gatha Grande here, following on. Is he going to get fourth place? Uh, very close there, on the line. To himself, I think it was Giannetti then. The rest of the field dragged themselves over the top. Padenzano, the Italian champion, sweating with profusion. Brooks goes over the line. You can see the state of these riders. So confirmation of the top five are picked out for his rebellion that finished, uh, finished in sixth spot, then Zweig seventh and uh, Fratini uh, in eighth. The man says he tapping the side of his nose, watch out for in the legs, Baston Liège. He had to ride today for his teammate uh, if Jenny bears him, but if you want to put a long shot on the bookies, nip down and have a go at Fratini, says he. Riders, uh, by the way, when they, you see them coming up here as we look at this slow motion action replay, well, they still drive on hard. Is that uh, these events all carry points? Whoops, a near collision there, not delivered at all. Fondres wouldn't do a thing like that. So, Maurizio Fondres giving best to Jalaba yet again. A rerun almost, but this time uphill rather than on the flat of the Milan San Remo when Jalaba ran out Victor to really show that he was back with a bang after that tremendous crash last year in the Tour de France. Now, Huy has seen some interesting finishes in the uh, Tour over in the uh, Flesh Valone over the years, and here, Seagulls at play. <laughs> and there we are. <laughs> so that's the rostrum, that's the riders, not the Seagulls. Fondrist uh, in second place round Jalabert, Burrs in third. The Flesh Valone giving a French victory, the seventh French victory then to Laurent Jalabert, Leclerc in 87, Finon in 86, uh,